Let's take you through the making of the Ray Phillips tinfoil phonographs. When Ray decided to make a production run of tinfoil phonographs, he called Joe Renato and asked if he would be the foreman of his project. There's Joe. The first thing he did was photo document the original Edison phonograph from top to bottom. Then he took it all apart. His team took measurements of everything and then proceeded to make molds of the main body for casting. After the main molds were made, they took them to a foundry and had the parts cast in bronze. Casting is still done much the same way it was in Edison's time. Bronze ingots are heated in a furnace until they are molten, and the molten bronze is then poured into the molds. After the bronze has cooled, the castings are removed and cleaned up somewhat, and are now ready for our work to begin. Casting is anything but perfect, and we will need the parts to be as perfect as possible if they are going to record and play properly. One of the most important things is to make sure the base is flat, and there is a highly technical, state-of-the-art way of flattening the bases. Observe. The plates are sanded, filed, and made ready for drilling and machining. To machine the bearing posts for the shaft to slip through, the parts are mounted in a mill and then a small hole is drilled where the shaft will go. After that a slightly larger hole, then a larger, and a larger, and still a larger hole is drilled to get within one ten thousandth of an inch of the diameter that is needed. The part is reamed by hand to get it to the exact size needed. And that's half of them. Other bronze parts that are machined are the reproducer stands and lockdown levers, crank assemblies, and the two halves of the reproducer itself. And remember all the grooves in the edge of the reproducer? They are machined with a special knurling tool as well. Now we will make the steel shaft and mandrill. These parts are made from steel rods that are slightly larger than is needed. The rod for the shaft is placed in a lathe and is then surfaced with a cutting tool to the proper diameter. Then, with a different tool, the threads are cut into one end of the shaft. Since you can only cut a small amount of metal at a time, it takes 15 passes to get to the proper depth. Then the shaft is removed and the other end is inserted to cut a notch for the crank handle. Fifteen passes later and it looks like it is just the right size. We have already cut the mandrills from their raw stock and drilled the hole in the center slightly smaller than the diameter of the shaft. The mandrill is now heated until it expands big enough so that the hole will slip over the shaft. The shaft must be inserted quickly because after only a few minutes of cooling the mandrill will contract tightly onto the shaft. By the time you are done heating the last of the mandrels, the first one is just about cool enough to put back on the lathe. First, the face is surfaced to the exact diameter needed, and then the rough edges are removed with a file. As with the shaft, a cutting tool is used to make the 15 passes needed to put the threaded grooves into the mandrel.
The final step is polishing the mandrel on a polishing wheel. Once all the metalwork is done, the phonographs are assembled to make sure all the parts fit properly. Then we take them apart again and send them out to be painted. While they are out being painted, we will make the wood horn. To make the horn, a piece of wood stock is placed in a lathe and surfaced until it is smooth. The cutting tool is changed and the piece of wood is given its shape. Once the parts are back from the painter, it is time for the pin striping. Ray stops by to check the work. It takes a keen eye and a steady hand and lots and lots of patience. One by one, the pieces are given their unique accents and as the day wears on, we are that much closer to a finished product. The last task is to make the reproducer. The reproducer is the most sensitive and delicate part of the phonograph and special care must be taken in this process or the phonograph will not work. Spring steel, mica and a needle are adjusted ever so slightly until the reproducer is just right. After we have assembled all the parts, Ray stops by to see if the phonograph will work. Well, Ray, what do you say? Shall we see if these things work? I'm ready when you are. All right, let's try it. All right, now we're going to lay that foil down flat on the mandrel, as flat as we can. Bring her around. <coughs> Rotate the mandrel around here as best we can. All right, let's wind her back. the gate, get a little collecting horn up. And Ray, you were saying that these machines shouldn't be cranked too slowly. They should be fairly rapid so we don't compress the recording. Hello, hello, hello! Mary had a little lamb, her fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, her lamb was sure to go. Right? Maybe I ran out of, ran out of voice there, but now we roll the mandrel back. With trembling hand, we close the gate as Mr. Edison did some 130 years ago to see if we trapped the human voice mechanically. The vibrations are beautiful. Yeah, they came up pretty good. This thing might work, Ray. What do you think? I'm waiting. Oh, well. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edison, wherever you are. <laughs>
And thank you, Joe, for doing what, <laughs> and you're, you're a nice workman for doing such a wonderful job on these. Well, I just want to say one thing. If it wasn't for Mr. Ray Phillips, collectors would not have an opportunity to have these and to use them and to experience them. So thank you. Thank you for all the collectors in the world. It's a pleasure, and I hope you all have a lot of fun with them. Thank you.